Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 23 kind of starts out right here by just making it perfectly clear uh, who it is that's kind of prohibited from entering the congregation of the Lord. Now, what I believe it's referring to here when it says the congregation of the Lord is talking about the actual ceremonial practice. Like they weren't going to, these are people that were barred from participating in, you know, going to the tabernacle and offering the sacrifices and things like that. I, you know, maybe, you know, I'm kind of, maybe I could stand to study that out a little bit more. Maybe anybody else has some thoughts on that. I don't think that this is saying that they were not allowed to become a part of the nation of Israel, but rather that they were barred from the ceremonial practices uh, that went along with the priesthood at that time. They were, they were not to be included in that. <coughs> and it starts out there, and it says in verse 1, and it gives us, you know, giving us this list of people that can't enter into the congregation of the Lord. He that is wounded in the stones or hath his privy member cut off uh, shall not enter the congregation of the Lord. Uh, so that's somebody, you know, a man who's been damaged in that area, who's, who's, re who's wounded, uh, been wounded in that area. You know, uh, the God says, you know, you can't, you can't go in the congregation of the Lord. And there's probably a lot, of, you know, maybe we could unpack that and think about why that might be, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, but we're not going to. <laughs> we're going to move right along because there's, you know, I'd probably turn into a whole other sermon. But, you know, needless to say, you know, the, the, there's actually people out there that are doing that to themselves voluntarily. You know, it's not just, this isn't talking about a guy who went and had, you know, is, is uh, w what's the word they use? He's uh, transitioning, right? You know, that's not what's going on here. This is a guy who's, you know, probably inadvertently through no fault of his own, just been hurt in this way. But yet God says, you know, this guy is not allowed in the congregation of the Lord. He goes on and says in verse two, a bastard shall not enter the congregation of the Lord, even unto his 10th generation, shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Uh, uh, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the, into the congregation of the Lord, because they met you out of uh, not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam the son of Beor, of Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse thee. If you recall that story, when they're about to come into the, in the land of Canaan, they go and they hire Balaam to curse the people, and he goes up on the mountain. And he says, I'll speak as the Lord, you know, gives him, uh, moves him to speak. And he ends up actually blessing them, right? And he was hired to, to curse them. But he's saying, look, you're not going to do well. You're, these people are barred unto the 10th generation because they, you know, they did not meet you with bread and water and because they hired Balaam to curse you. Uh, it says in verse 5, Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee because the Lord thy God loved thee. And thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all their days forever. You know, real quick, we can just look at verse 5 and see that, you know, what people, sometimes people get really worried about what others might do to them. You know, they're, they're afraid to stand up for God or live for the Lord or take a stand for Christ because they're afraid of maybe the curse that would come upon them. But it says there, you know, that God turned the curse that, that, ba that Balaam had been hired to uh, pronounce upon the people and he turned it unto a blessing. You know, and, and here's the thing, if God be for us, who can be against us? You know, if God doesn't want you to be cursed by somebody, it's not going to happen. You know, if there's somebody out there that has ill will against you, that has, you know, uh, you know, bad intent that wants to harm you in some way, but you're right with God, you know, you love the Lord, you know, God will protect us. God will keep us safe. And he says there in verse 6, Thou shalt not seek their peace, nor their prosperity, all thy days forever. So this is some kind of heavy, uh, you know, a heavy judgment that came down on these people. And really what we can see from these verses, and I just kind of want to take a minute to look at, is the fact that this, what we see a lot today in a lot of churches these days is this policy of everybody's welcome. All are welcome. Everybody's welcome into the house of God. That's, well, we read this and we see not a biblical concept. Mm -hmm. That in fact, all are not welcome. That there are some people that even then God said, they're not even allowed unto the 10th generation. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's not just 10 years. It's not a decade. He's talking about, uh, you know, there's different ways of measuring it. It could be anywhere from 30 years until, you know, an actual a generation of like your, of the next people that are born. You know, like your, your father was a generation, your grandfather's another generation. And nowadays we measure it by about 30 years. We say this is generation X, this is generation Y, this is generation, you know, the millennials, the boomers. It's about separated by about 30 years, right? But I think what the way they're counting it back then you know, it was more like your father, you know, your grandfather, that was one generation. His son, that's a generation. His son, that's a generation. So 10 of these generations had to pass before these people could be, were allowed into the congregation of the Lord. Very serious punishment that God doled out on them. And 
<clears throat> you know, it, and it just shows us that this, this everybody's welcome, you know, come as you are, you know, you, everybody, the doors are wide open, no matter, you know, what you're into, you know, is not a biblical concept. You say, oh, that's Old Testament. Well, <clears throat> do yourself a favor and read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when you go home tonight. And you'll actually see that there are people that, you know, if they're involved in certain sins like drunkenness, covetousness, extortion, you know, fornication, you know, that e even those that are called a brother are to be put out of the local, ch lo local church until they get right. So that's just real quick on the surface there. That's what we can get at it. But what I really want to focus on, you know, and this is kind of a sensitive subject today because unfortunately there are a lot of people that fall into this classification. But it needs to be preached on so that fewer people can fall in this classification. And that is this term that the Bible uses called bastard. Okay? Now that's a term that's kind of fallen out of style, but you know, it's one that the Bible uses. And, you know, it's, and we see here, you know, it kind of tops the list of people that are barred from entering into the congregation of the Lord. He says, the bastard shall not enter in. You know, and imagine being barred for ten generations. And that, I mean, imagine saying, I'm not going to be able to go in. My great, my, my son, my grandson, my great, great grandson, my great, 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 I mean, it's just, that's heavy, right? So when God's laying, doling out a punishment like that, we should probably perk up and listen to who it is that's not allowed in. You know, now I don't think there's any, you know, there's probably no, uh, you know, Moabites in here, you know, there's probably no, you know, anybody else, but, you know, there, there's a good chance today, you know, that there might be somebody that would fall under the classification of bastard, Okay. And I'm not saying that to hurt people's feelings. I'm not saying that to, uh, you know, pick on anybody, you know, uh, and, and, and you say, well, some people might even know what that term is. What does that bastard even mean? And basically, uh, and, and I think biblically what it's referring to is somebody who is of an illegitimate birth, okay? Someone who's, whose father is not, you know, today we would say it's somebody who, whose father is not involved, okay? But really what it is is somebody who's born out of wedlock, okay? And it used to be a very shameful thing. Uh, today, obviously, it's, it's accepted in society. But you know what? Our, us as Christians, our social mores do not change with society. They're founded upon the Word of God. Okay? Now, if you've made that mistake, if you are the result of that relationship, I, have no, I harbor no ill will towards you. And I'm not saying you're not welcome in church for 10 generations. <laughs> okay? You are welcome in church. Okay? But this is just the, the, the concept is here in the Bible, and this is the way it would have been back then. And, and you say, why did God dole out such a heavy punishment? Because fatherless homes are detrimental to society. They're, and we're going to look at some statistics here in a minute. And that's a fact. You know, and, and, and this does strike a little bit close to home with me. You know, I, my parents were, were married when, I, when they gave birth to me. But, you know, I know what it's like to grow up in a broken home. I know what it's like to grow up where the parents divorced at a young age. You know, quite, in a, in a, in a, in a, not a very pleasant one. A very tumultuous time leading up to it. Not a, a pleasant topic. So I sympathize, you know, with people that are in that position, okay, to some degree, okay? But it's something that we need to preach about because we, God, you know, puts such an emphasis on here. He, he's, he's saying, look, this is a real heavy punishment, you know, so we should probably think about what it means to be a bastard, why God would, you know, uh, have such a heavy punishment on such a thing like this. And really what it'll end up doing, too, is it will encourage people to, it's a way of to preach purity, you know, God wants people to go to the wedding altar pure. God wants a man and woman to be married before. He wants them, you know, not, we always say all oh, the ladies should be, but it goes for the men too. You know, God wants men and women to go to their wedding day virgin. And that's, that's his will there. And, and the, the reason why uh, this is, you know, and, and you say, well, you, you laugh at that. You think that's funny, but here's the thing. People are not observing that, and that's why we're ending up with the society that we have. Because people think it's, oh, I'm just going to live however I want, you know, and, and the school will tell you, and, you know, your friends will tell you, and everybody will tell you, just do whatever you want, do what feels good, sleep around all you want. They don't tell you about the diseases you're going to catch. Well, they'll say, just be safe about it. You know, that doesn't always work. You know, I personally know people that were, doing, you know, that were being safe about it, you know, <laughs> using their prophylactics and ended up with children, okay? So don't think that, you know, what, what the, uh, you know, they're going to tell you at school is necessarily true when it comes to this subject. You know, let's, I'd rather trust God and his word, you know, and just say, hey, if God expects people to be pure at their wedding day, do it. And there's nothing shameful about that, by the way. That's a, that's a virtuous thing. The Bible puts a premium on people keeping themselves pure until their wedding day. You know, and if you've already made that mistake in here, you've already, you know, you've already ruined that for yourself, 
again, I'm not against you. You know, confess that sin, forsake that sin, and don't do it again. And say, from this day forward, I'm going to keep myself pure under the Lord until my wedding day. But, you know, it's not, it's not a shameful thing. It's not anything to be embarrassed about. You know, I, I'll tell you right now, I went to my wedding uh, altar virgin. And you know what? I'm glad for it. I'm glad that that was something I kept under my wife. You know, I'm glad that that was something I've shared only with her. So there's nothing shameful about it. That's why we need to preach about this stuff. Because we're all brainwashed and turned around and backwards from the media and Hollywood and the schools and everybody else telling us the complete opposite of what the Bible says. So welcome to a Baptist church. We're going to preach the Bible tonight. Okay, it says here that the bastards were not allowed in. Okay, and he and he's he's putting an emphasis on it. And you know, before we get into that, I do want to point out the fact too, though, that uh, you know he, he's he puts an emphasis also on the Ammonites and the Moabites. Right? He's saying, well, what did they do? You know, what was their big mistake that they were barred under the you know the this gener you know x amount of generations? And well, it's because of the fact that they didn't meet them with bread and with water, right, in the way. And then on top of that, they went and cursed them, right? So what that would show us is that we ought to be careful how we treat God's people. You ought to be careful about how you treat God's people. God, God you know, watches over his children and protects them. He cares about how other people treat them. You know, I think about that a lot when we're out knocking doors, soul winning and preaching to people, how they treat us at the door. You know, I don't ever feel like I have to retaliate or anything like that because I know it's like, well... God's watching. God's watching how you're going to be nasty and mean or whatever. And it's never that bad. I don't think they're doing anything worthy of this, obviously. But it's just something to think about, you know, is that, it, it, that and, and that we also, even as Christians, we should be careful how we treat one another. You know, we should treat each other kindly, hospitably, you know, be kindly, affectionate one to another. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 13 to be, uh, to be not forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby... Uh, some have entertained angels unawares. You know, we should be careful how we, uh, that we're not inhospitable. And at the very least, we should never be vindictive you know, towards God's people like they were towards God's people. He, so uh, again, he's, he's putting the emphasis here on, on you know, uh, several different people. But you know, the emphasis on the shame of being a bastard, I want to kind of take a look at this for a minute. It was a public shame to be a bastard back then, to be born out of wedlock. And it says, and you say, well, how much so? Well, look at verse 7. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because he was a stranger in his land. And it, it says that they were allowed uh, to actually go into the congregation even before them. I'm losing my place a little bit. We're going to move on here. But it says, uh, you know, that it was, a, it, was a, a debt, it was a public shame. Now, why was it such a shameful thing to be a bastard here? Because of the detrimental effects on society. Okay, I'll just come out and say it. When people do, are growing up in fatherless homes, it's, it's a detriment to society. And I actually took the time. You know how I love statistics, right? Because people don't often believe the Bible. People will say, oh, that's just what the Bible says. But when you actually get up and actually start to read them what the world says, that even though the, 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 the world itself looks at this and goes, oh, this isn't good. You know, I looked this up. You can go read an article from USA Today. Go read an article from NPR. Not exactly, a, you know, the bastion of conservative thought. NPR, okay, but the, even they recognize that society today is plagued by fatherless homes, that it's having a negative impact on our society and on our culture. So I'm just going to read to you, you know, I'm going to read to you some, some statistics tonight. 63% of youth suicides, okay, people committing suicide in their teenage years, 63% of them come from fatherless homes. 90%, that's 90%, that's a staggering figure of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. You say it's a coincidence. Come on. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. They're making up the vast majority of these negative statistics. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. Now, I don't know an a rapist who doesn't have an anger problem, but who knows how they define that. Right? 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. You know, and you say, well, what's the connection here? Well, it's because people who come from fatherless homes often don't ever have anybody take them aside and remind them that there's consequences for their actions. They don't get to just act on every impulse. You know, that's dad's job often to take the children aside and deal with them and remind them that there's rules and that there's consequences for your actions. 71% 71, 71 of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 
You know, and you know, let me just be perfectly candid, just in case anybody feels like I'm picking on them. You know, you're looking at one. You're looking at a high school dropout who came from a father's home. So I can relate to these figures. Maybe that it helps you understand why I'm not the brightest. No. <laughs> I don't know. They probably, probably would have done more harm. I shouldn't say that. Anyway, 70% uh, 70 of youths in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. 70%. Okay? 85%. These aren't just like 40, 30. Do you hear, are you hearing the percentages I'm giving you? 80, 90, 70? Don't tell me this isn't having a negative impact on our society. It is. 85% of all youths in prisons come from fatherless homes. That's 20 times the average. I'm almost done. You know, daughters of single parents without a father are 53% more likely to marry as teenagers. Now, that's not always the worst thing in the world, you know, if, you know, 18, 19 maybe, but I think this is referring to people who are getting married way too young. 711%. 711%. Not 100%, not 71%. 711%. More likely to have children as teenagers. You know, and why is that? It's because women, girls, are far more impressionable. They're mo more easily led astray. You know, Eve, was, was, Eve was, was deceived and was not in the transgression, but Adam was because he was not deceived. He went along with it, right? That's what the Bible tells us. Women are more easily led astray, right? They're more easily impressed upon by some smooth-talking guy who's just going to tell her everything she wants to hear, lie to her face, you know, just so he can get what he wants. And then they end up, in this position here, you know, pregnant and without a father for their child. <coughs> more likely to have, 700% uh, more likely to have children as teenagers, 164% more likely to have a premarital birth, and 92% more likely to get divorced themselves. So there's one reason to stay married right there. If you want your kids to stay married when they get married, that's probably a good reason for you to get mar stay married. Because parents or children often do what the parents do. 43%, don't, don't lose me here, we're talking about, remember what we're talking about, we're talking about why God is putting such a strong punishment on those that are called bastards within society, those that are coming from an illegitimate birth, a fatherless home. You say the Bible's being harsh. Well, let's look at what it does to society. That's why I'm reading these figures, so don't, don't zone out on me. 43% of U.S. children live without their father. 43% of the children in the United States are living without a father. And I just read you all these statistics. You don't think this isn't having a detrimental effect on our society? And this is coming from somebody who grew up without a father. And I can tell you, it's, it's not good. It's negative. There's no good that comes of it. Terrible things happen. 71% of pregnant teenager, teenagers lack a father. Not a coincidence. Dad's not there to protect the daughter, to ward off these, you know, guys who are after only one thing, who are only interested in one thing about their teenage daughter. They have no good intention. Dad's not there with the, 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 the shoddy, right? The 12 gauge. You know, you can date my daughter, but you're going to stay within shotgun range. Right? That's how this dad's operating. I probably shouldn't joke like that. There's some little kid that's going to want to date one of my, my young daughters when they grow up. He's just like, not that one. He's always talking about how they got to buy cows and, you know, you'd be looking down a barrel or something like that. If you wonder about the cow thing, I'll tell you later. But uh, <laughs> I believe, you know, I, oh, I've already opened up the bag. So I, I'm saying, you know, I'm strongly considering putting a dowry on my daughters of a half, maybe even a full cow. And I'm talking grass-fed, hormone-free, you know, free-range cow, beef, right? And so anyway... My daughters are not going to like me when they get older. 85% of children who exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 90% of adolescents repeat arsonists. 90% of teenage repeat arsonists uh, live with only their mother. Now, I lit a field on father when my dad was still at home. Another story. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. I already read that. 75% of adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions have no father. 85% of youths in prison grow up in a fatherless home. Fatherless boys and girls are twice as likely to drop out of high school, twice as likely to end up in jail, four times more likely to need help for emotional or behavioral problems. 
So don't tell, you know, say, why does God make, put such a stiff punishment and use such a strong term as bastard? And why does he put such a stiff punishment? Because of that. Because of the negative detrimental effects. Now, I'm not saying, now, if, if that's you that tonight, you know, and I don't know everybody's situation. I don't, you know, I don't know every backstory in here. You know, but if that's you tonight, you know, you say, well, I kind of fall, I fall into that classification of bastard. Well, don't let this be you. Don't let this be you. You know, be on your guard. Understand that, you know, the odds might be stacked against you a little bit. But if you're saved, you have a heavenly father. You know, you have a father in heaven who can guide you and lead you and protect you. Uh, so look to him. And you say, well, is it really that big of a deal? Well, let me just end by doing a little bit of math. Okay, because we've looked at the detrimental effects. We've looked on the, the harsh punishment, the strong language that God uses to describe the situation. So the question then becomes, how many people in this country are like that? Well, in 2018, there were 3,791,712 births, okay? And for every 1,000 births, there were 40 were born to unwed mothers. 40 for every 1,000 births were to unwed mothers, okay? So the math, you know, 3,791 births, you know, divided by 1,000, time is 3,791, right? Should I, get, I should have gotten a whiteboard. Times 40. Okay, because remember, for every thousand, there's 40 children that are born to unwed mothers. Uh, so that's 3,791 times 40, which comes to 151,668. In 2018 alone, just in 2018, there were, there were, 1, 000, there were over 150,000 children born in this country with no father. That's one year. That's staggering. You know, that's a quarter of the, two, the population of the city of Tucson. That's one quarter of it. So in four years, you have an entire city the size of Tucson of children that don't have a father. And, you know, we make light of fathers today. And the world mocks fatherhood today. And it's, absolute, it, it's an absolute cornerstone of a healthy family and the healthy society is to have a father in the home. <coughs> so that should, you know, that's why God uses this language. That's why God puts such an emphasis. That's why God's being, you know, harsh about it. It's because he doesn't want this for his people. You know, he knows what's best. He designed us. He made us a certain way. And he made children to need to grow up in a home that has both. That has the influence of a father and the influence of a mother to raise those children. <coughs> so that's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to spend a lot, the whole sermon on that. You know, that's a whole sermon in and of itself. Fatherhood. But, you know, that is something that God touches on here, doesn't he? You know, we kind of just gloss over that, verse 2. A bastard shall not in the congregation of the Lord even to his tenth generation. And then just moves on. But when we really stop and think about it, and we really look at where we're at in this, in this country today, you know, it, it should give us pause. And you know what? It should cause those of us that have not made that mistake to determine in our lives that we're not going to be part, we're not going to raise children who are going to be part of that statistic. You know, or if we are those people, that we're not going to be a part of that statistic. <clears throat> so we'll move on here. Look there at verse, uh, verse 7. It says, Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in, in his land. Verse 8, there it is. I missed it earlier. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. I mean, that's how strong God feels about, you know, these, pe these other people not entering in into the tenth generation. He's going to let strangers who aren't even Israelites in before them. <coughs> and he says, uh, you know, and the other thing too is to, you say, why do, the, why do the Egyptians and the Edomites, why do they kind of get, you know, only to the third generation? Well, he kind of explains it there. He is thy brother, the Edomite, right? He was born of Esau. And then also uh, the Egyptians, right? And they, they at one time treated God's people well. So the inverse is true too. If, God's, if people treat God's people poorly, people... If people treat God's people poorly, <coughs> they suffer for it. God, you know, will there, there'll be there'll be a, a price to pay, you know, retribution. But on the inverse, you know, you have the Egyptians, the Edomites, the Egyptians. You know, they welcomed Jacob and all his sons into the land, gave them the Goshen, gave them the best of the land. He said, "The best of the land is before thee," and let them take that. And then also, you know, the, the Edomites as well. They they met them in the way. So. God remembers the evil that is done unto God's people, and God remembers the good that is done unto his people. 
Look there in verse 9, it says, when the, ho when the host goeth forth against thine enemies, then keep thee from every wicked thing. So as we're kind of rounding out the book of Deuteronomy, we're getting these last chapters. It's the same in Exodus too. I don't know if you've been following along with Pastor Anderson's sermons online. But you start when you get to the end of these books, he just starts to hit you with just like a verse of this, a verse of that. It's just a lot of random things. You've probably noticed that the last couple weeks. This is kind of more of that. He, does, he just kind of touches on something real quick. And he's saying, look, if... Uh, if uh, there be, uh, where is it? When, thou go, when, the, when the host goeth forth against thine enemies, he's saying, you know, when you're going out to war, thou shalt keep thyself from every wicked thing. So, of course, they were going against wicked people. You know, the perfect example of that was Achan, you know, when they, the city of Jericho fell. He said, you know, that, that whole city, they weren't even touched at anything. And he ended up taking what? You know, a wedge of, of silver, I believe it was, not gold. Maybe it was gold, I can't remember now. And a Babylonian a Babylonian garment. Right, and it ended up costing him his life and his family's too, you know. And that's that, that, that's kind of another story. But the the other principle is this: is too is that you know men, you know men that work out of town. Because what is he talking about when you're going forth to battle? You know, men would leave are leaving their home, right, and they're going out and they're fighting battles in distant lands. They're away from their family, people that know them, their kindred, their friends, you know, people that kind of keep you accountable, right. People that you, you, you wouldn't behave certain, you wouldn't risk, you know, doing certain behaviors for fear of getting caught because it's much easier when you're in a familiar area and everybody knows you. They recognize you if they see you coming out of such and such place, right? Well, if you're in another land, you know, if you're in another place, nobody knows me. Maybe I can get away with this, right? So men that work out of town, men that, you know, travel are, are away from home for great lengths of times should really guard themselves and keep themselves from every wicked thing. You know, things you might not think you would ever get be tempted with here at home. You say, well, I'd never end up in a strip club or I'd never end up in a, in a casino. You know, I'd never end up trying to solicit, you know, some prostitute somewhere in some corner in my, my neck of the woods. You know, if you're not careful, if you, you know, if you don't take heed to this, you might find yourself in a distant city someday. You've been away for several weeks. You know, you're kind of bored. Maybe the other guys around you are into that kind of thing. Hey, why don't you come out to the casino with us tonight? We don't know where that kind of stuff leads. So that's just kind of, you know, I'm trying to apply this stuff as we go, you know. Um, I don't think any of us is going to be, you know, called to arms and being going out to war and, and, you know, anytime soon. But, you know, we can take that application from it. <coughs> he says there in verse 10, If there be any man among you that is not clean by the reason of uncleanness that chanceth him by night, then he shall go abroad out of the camp he shall not come within the camp. So, you know, guys, you know, that have experienced that, you know what he's talking about. If you need that explained to you, you know, you're probably too young or it doesn't concern you, okay? So, we, we you know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are like that. You know, it's just, we learn about that. We know what that's talking about because we've, we've gone through that. Verse 11, uh, but whether it be, uh, it shall be when evening cometh, he shall wash himself with water. And when the sun is done down, he shall come into the camp. Thou shalt have also a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad, and thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be, when thou shalt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. Right? So he's talking about what you're going to do when you ease yourself, is, is how the way the Bible puts it. Right? Because remember, you know, back then there wasn't, you know, plumbing on every corner. You know, when we go out abroad today, you know, we're, 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 say, we're saying, okay, it's three miles to the next Circle K. You know, I'm going, you know, I don't need to have a paddle with me. <laughs> There's not, I'm not to bury anything that come, comes forth from me, you know, because uh, it, it gets flushed, right? But back then, you know, God's making a point here, hey, bury that, you know? And you say, well, why is that? Why has God got to bring that up? Well, you know, man, it, when he's kind of, look, you don't have to go door knocking very long to see people that kind of just let themselves go a little bit. You know what I mean? I'm not saying to this extreme, but mankind has a tendency. Some people tend to do that. Okay? They, people don't, aren't taught character. They don't take care of themselves the way they should. You know, we, uh, you know I, I hate to talk bad about people, but sometimes you have to just kind of, you have examples that you see and you have to kind of, well, you know, why, you know, why is God bringing this up? Because it happens. You know, you know I, I had a friend a long time ago that it wasn't them easing themselves. It was their dog. And he wasn't doing it abroad. He was doing it in the house. <laughs> I remember he was very embarrassed 
you know, and his mom had a lot of problems. She, her, her, his dad died very young, tragically. She had, it was just, it was a mess. That family is a mess. I ended up staying the night over there. I had no idea about this. I was very, I was very young, you know, you know, high school. And I go upstairs to get a glass of water, and just the stench hits me. And I opened up, they had this, the whole living room. I'm not even kidding. The whole living room has this curtain in front of it. And I peeked in there, and it was just dog droppings mm. everywhere. I mean, you couldn't step. They just let the dogs go in there, you know. You know, we were out tonight, and did, I don't know, if Brother Gabriel, if you noticed the cat lady, right? How do you know she was a cat lady? I didn't see, I didn't see a lady, and I didn't see any cats. You know what I saw? A bunch, a bunch of cat food cans. Just, I mean, talking dozens of them. Just scattered all over the driveway. Just they, oh, she's opening it, the cats are eating, and she's not picking it up. I mean, I, I get leaving something behind and taking care of it later, you know. You know, at, why do today what can be done tomorrow, as the French say, right? But hey, do it tomorrow at least. When you come back out to feed that next can, can you just pick up the other one and go back in? So why has God put this in there? Because people tend to kind of just be slobs sometimes. And, you know, this particular thing that's talking about taking care of your human waste, that's not something you can mess around with. And that's, not, that's something that can get you very sick and even kill you. I mean, there's a reason why we have, you know, municipalities and, and water treatment plants and all that type of thing. So, you know, it's for sanitation, one, God's putting this in there as part of his law. This isn't just a recommendation saying, do it. Clean up after yourself. Cover that which comes forth from you. And of course, you know, the other thing we could go with this verse is that God's assuming that you're walking out the door with a weapon, right? Second Amendment, okay? That's another sermon. But <laughs> he's saying a paddle on your weapon, right? So, but he's saying, look, cover it up because of the sanitation purposes. You know, it's, it's disgusting. And because if you don't, it's a curse to you. And if you do, you know, it's a blessing, right? Because he, he says there in verse 14, for the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore thou shalt camp shall be holy, that he shall see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. So the other a a spiritual application we could take on this is that, you know, we're involved in a spiritual fight. You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principles, against powers, uh, against principalities and powers in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world, right? We're fighting a spiritual warfare today. You know, and if we want God in the midst of our camp, we got to keep our lives clean. You know, you can't just have your life full of filth and expect God to bless you. You know, you want God to help you, give you strength, lead you in the way, help you fight, give you strength day to day. You know, you got to clean up your life spiritually. You got to get, you know, forgive, pardon my French, the crap out of your life, the sin, the filth that he doesn't want to see. You know, and, and this is, but, so that's the, you know, spiritual thing, but there is the, pro the, the, the principle of just, you know, Sanitation, just basic sanitation. And, you know, I'm just going to touch on this for a minute because this needs to be said, okay? This needs to be said because I'm, you know, I'm going to give some advice to the single guys. I'm not saying there's anybody in this room that I know of, maybe, I don't know, could one day happen, I don't know. But here's, here's just a, it, I've run into just too many guys today that don't even understand this. Take a bath every day. If you're a dude, take a bath, okay? <laughs> you say, Brother Corbin, you know, I've, you know, I've caught a whiff of you every now and then. Yeah, but it's after a long day of soul winning and preaching, all right? And you know what I do in the next day? Take a bath. But then when it's like every day, every time I see you, every time I get near you, whoo! You know, it's ripe. And you say, does that happen? More often than I, I care to admit, I've run into this time and time again, different individuals. just like, dude, take a bath, man. And you have to tell them that. And it's like, didn't you learn this growing up? You know, my, I don't know why I'm saying this, but my wife, you know, she was shocked. Because she, I, she, when I first got married, I was taking two baths a day. I was showers, I wasn't taking baths. Dudes don't take baths, okay? <laughs> if you're a dude taking a bath, man, don't even talk to me. <laughs> There's a time and a place, I suppose. But I was like, I was doing two, but now I was, because I was working a hard physical job. You know, I woke up in the morning, I, it was just part of my morning routine. And it's hard, it's hard to fathom that this is even a thing for guys. That they get up and they wonder if they should bathe. If they should clean their flesh. If they should get the stink off their body. Yes! Like, come on, you know? And, and, and I would do that in the morning and then I'd go out and work a hard day's labor and I would smell. 
which, you know, was perfectly natural, but I didn't stew in it. You know, I didn't revel in that. And I certainly didn't force other people around me to have to smell that. You know, and, I, and, I, and that's the most offensive thing. You know, it's like, and here's why it has to be said, because pe some guys, they don't even realize it. They're nose deaf, man. That you can't even smell your own stink sometimes. People get so used to their own stench, and it's like somebody has to come and tell you and say, look, dude, you need to take a bath. If that's happening in your life, I mean, you need to take inventory. <laughs> say, well, what happened? <laughs> you know, so here's, that's just some advice. You know, unless you want to be single for the rest of your life, because I tell you what, that funk that's coming off you is woman repellent. <laughs> that's what you should call it. Body odor is too gentle a term. It's, 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 uh, you know, you want to name that scent? You want to bottle that and sell it? It's called bachelorhood for life. <laughs> that's what I call it. <laughs> anyway, got that off my chest. All right. There's nothing that bothers me more than, than I get it. Everybody has a long day. We live in Phoenix, you know, every now and then you might be a little on the ripe side, but when that's a way of life for you, dude, something ain't right. You got to fix that. All right, let's move on. Verse 15, he says, uh, Thou shalt not deliver unto, unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. You know, he shall dwell with thee, even among you, in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates, where it liketh him best, but thou shalt not oppress him. So he's saying, look, if a guy is escaped from his master, you know, he says, don't return him unto him. Don't take him by force and, and take him back. And, uh, you know, one, you might not know what kind of master he had, he might have been a bad guy. Why would a guy run away from his master if he's being paid for his work, if he's working off debt, if he's being taken care of? Because God lines out rules for masters and servants, you know, and they were not to be um, treated poorly. So if a person's to the place where they're running away, you know, they're probably trying to get away from a bad situation. I mean, the perfect example of that is, of course, what took place in this country, you know, when we had slavery and, and we had people who would try to emancipate themselves by escaping to the north. You know, that's a perfect example. You know, you weren't supposed to turn around and take them back down to their plantation and drop them off, you know. Uh, so that's, that's that. And he goes on in, in verse 17. This is another place we've got to kind of park it for a minute because this is important doctrine that we needs to be preached today. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog unto the house of the Lord uh, thy God for any vow. For even these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So first of all, again, strong language in here the world would say, right? Bastard, whore, okay? Those are biblical words, you know? And I've even heard, you know, Christians, Baptists even, object to using these kind of language. That's the language of the Bible, my friend. You know, the, but you like it. And here's the thing, with the, the real irony about that is those same people, they like it a whole lot plainer than that when they're watching TV. They'll go listen to the world, say all kinds of filth, and just like not even bad an eye at it. Some preacher gets up and says, whore. Ah! I can't believe you'd say that. You don't have a problem with the word. You have a problem with, you know, the word of God. Okay. You know, the Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. I'm not going to be the guy that's going to set up and get up here and say, well, whore's, whore's not, uh, is an impure word. We shouldn't use that. Because the Bible says the words of the Lord are pure. They're right. right? These are the right words to use. And quite frankly, you know, if we started using this language to describe these things, like, you know, adultery is another one. We all want to call it an affair, you know. They want to put a bow on that. They want to doll it up. They want to make that sound like it's not that bad. It's an affair. You know, an affair is you getting together and having tea and crumpets, okay. <laughs> affair is not sleeping around with another person's spouse. That's adultery, called the Bible, according to the Bible. So whore is a biblical term. It means prostitute, right? Ezekiel 16, I'll read to you. It says, they give gifts to all whores, okay? You know, a gift being they pay for their services. That's what a whore is, a prostitute. And if you would, go over to Leviticus. Keep something there where you're at. We go over to Leviticus chapter 21 because, we know, we need to talk about this again. Why? Because remember, God's saying, there shall not be. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite. He's not saying you're gonna, your land's going to be so blessed that there won't even be any. What he's saying when he says there shall be none, he's saying they're not allowed. Like, they shouldn't be alive, is what he's saying. Okay? <coughs> and, and, you know, here's the thing. I feel like I've been talking about this, bringing up the death penalty almost every other week going through Deuteronomy. 
but it's not because I'm up here beating my chest. It's because that's where we're at in the book. That's where we're at in the Word of God. It's the Word of God that says these things, okay? So he says, first of all, that, you know, there shall be no whore, and the reason why they're not going to be there is because they won't be alive because being a whore is punishable by death, according to the Bible. It's an offense worthy of death. You're in Leviticus chapter 21. I'll remind you what we read last week in Deuteronomy 22. But if this thing be true, remember if it was found out that a, a, a woman which was betrothed had been playing the harlot, right? And the, and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of the city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. Saying, look, if one of your daughters plays the whore in your father's house, you know, they're not, they weren't even allowed to take her to the city square. Take her outside the door of the house, and that's where it went down. And stoning to death. That's the Bible, okay? And look at Leviticus chapter 21, verse 9. And the daughter of any priest, if she, so, you know, there's already the death penalty, but now it's like if it's the daughter of a priest, it's even a worse death. I mean, I don't know which is worth, worse here, but you be the judge of that. If the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she, ha she profaneth her father. Okay, remember this whole thing in Deuteronomy 2 and here as well in Leviticus is not only the fact that what she's done is wicked, but it also brings a shame and reproach unto her father. She shall be burnt with fire. <laughs> Which would you rather have? <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know, I think the fire is probably worse. You know, I don't want to go into it, but this is extreme punishments so that God's doling out here. And you say, well, you know, what did I stumble into tonight? You stumbled into a church that preaches the Bible. That's what you stumbled into. Uh, John chapter 8. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, what did Jesus say in John chapter 8 when they brought the woman taken in adultery? And they, they asked her, you know, should, you know, Moses said that she, be, she, she should be stoned, but what say you? you know, what they were trying to do is catch Jesus in his words because at that time it was illegal to put any man to death. Remember when they brought Jesus to be crucified and, and, the, and Pilate said to judge him according to your law? He said that he should die. And they said, but it's not lawful for us to put any man to death. That was left up to the civil government, as it is today, by the way. I'm never advocating for any one of us to enact these things in our personal life. Of course, this is something that a civil government is supposed to be carrying out, according to God's word. But what did Jesus say when they took this, brought this woman? Because you say, oh, this, this stoning, the burning with fire, that's Old Testament. It's a different God. It's a different thing, you know, today. Jesus said, he lifted up himself and said to them, he that is with sin without, well, among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now, I get that Jesus was trying to also, at this time, you know, he was trying to, you know, play their own, put their own game back on them, right? He was trying to say, hey, you know, he, he, was, he wasn't answering their question directly. He wasn't falling for their trap. But you know what else he, he did in the process of doing that? He said, stoner. <laughs> he didn't say, oh, that, that's Old Testament. You know, that, I've changed my mind about that, about adultery. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a different today. Look, Jesus is the word of God, you know, and he changeth not. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This isn't a different God that we're dealing with in the Old Testament. It's the same God. Okay? And he said, cast a stone at her. Right? <clears throat> you say, well, that's harsh. You know, burning people, stoning the whores, burning them. <clears throat> Why? You know, and by the way, the dog, the sodomite, the Bible says, we all, I mean, it's practically a life verse for this church, you know, Leviticus 20 and 13. You know, it is a, the, 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 the of, uh, their blood shall be upon them. They have committed abomination. If a man lie also with mankind, they shall surely be put to death. They have committed upon ab abomination. Their blood shall be upon them. You know, death penalty is, is, goes out for homosexuality as well, according to the Bible. <coughs> you say, that's harsh. Yeah, it is. But all of this is in here to protect society. Because you're talking about some of the worst elements of society. We're talking about whores and dogs, which is sodomites. You know, and, and whores, you know, we, we always like to pick on the sodomites and amen to that. But, you know, whores, you know, they're, as much, they're, they're a detriment to society as well. You know, they, they, one for their, to themselves, okay? That's not, you know, and I get a lot of them get wrapped up into that because they get hooked on drugs. They get, you know, sold into, you know, the, the human trafficking and things like that. And, but some of them, you know, they just, it, it's, it's an unfortunate thing, but it's detrimental. I mean, it's passing around disease. It's, you know, it's, it's fostering infidelity, all kinds of things. And the Bible says in Proverbs 23, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. 
For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait for prey, and increaseth the transgressors among men. God is saying that when you let whoredom run wild in society, it increases the transgressors among men. And that's the truth. When you have whole cities like, I don't know, Las Vegas, where you know if you, go, you can go visit a whore at a brothel, it's totally legal. You don't have to worry about anyone busting you and, and you know, getting arrested. It's not going to be a sting operation. You're not going to end up in cuffs. You know, that increases the transgressors among men. You know, men are just, what, o what other ungodly lust can I, do I get to fulfill? Well, that felt pretty good. Let me do it again. And all these just evils come upon society. But to the individual, I want to point out this in Proverbs 23, where it says here that a whore is a deep ditch. Listen to the language God is using to describe the whore. He's calling her a deep ditch. The strange woman, and it's not talking about the girl who looks funny. It's talking about, you know, she's a foreigner to you. She's not your wife. She's strange. She's a foreigner. Uh, is a narrow pit. You know, I'm sure, you know, those of us that have worked in, in underground utility work or dug any holes know that if you get down in a deep ditch, sometimes it's hard to get out, especially when it's narrow and you can't get any leverage. You know, it, it, people fall into that sin of, you know, going to prostitutes and things like that. You might never come back from that. <laughs> That's a deep ditch that you fall into. Your life will just whoop, fall down a hole. It's deep. If you'll be lucky to crawl, crawl your way out, it's a narrow pit. It's like being down in a deep pit and you can't even get a foothold to get out. You know, it's like being buried alive when you think about it. <coughs> and he says in Leviticus, go over to 19, I should have had you turn there. So why is he having such a harsh punishment on the sin of prostitution and whoredom? Because of the detrimental effects it has on society? Because it ruins men's lives? Because it increases the transgressors among men, as it says in Proverbs? Look at Levit Leviticus 19, 29. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. You'll say, well, how does whoredom lead to all the land being full of wickedness? Can you just trust God? How about we just trust God on this? Let's not try and find out. Let's not, say if, let's see, let's, let's test the Bible and see if that's true. Well, let's see if God's right about that. Let's prostitute our daughters. Let's, let's see if the land falls to whoredom. Let's see maybe if it becomes full of wickedness. You know what you're going to find out is that it's true. And then, you're gonna, and then your latter end's going to be even worse. You go, oh, turns out God was right. Land's full of wickedness, and now it's too late to do anything about it. So that's him talking about the whore, but he also makes reference here to a dog. You know, and that might throw up some people, okay? And this is a doctrine that needs to be preached. It says here, verse 17, back where you were in Deuteronomy 23, there shall be no whore among the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Now, we all know what a sodomite is, okay? At least we, if we've been in church at all. A sodomite is, you know, Somebody who was guilty of the sin uh, that took place in the land of Sodom. Okay, and remember, excuse me, remember the story of Lot in the land of Sodom, and the, the angels come because God had heard the 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 the, wicked, the cry of Sodom, and he was going down to see if the thing be true, if the wicked, if it was really as wicked as it was, the city of Sodom. So God sends two of his angels into the city of Sodom, and he goes in there, and the angels find Lot, which was Abraham's nephew. And the Bible says he was a just man, although he was living in a wicked city. And the angels went into, the, into Lot's house for the evening. In fact, because Lot had to implore them to come in. He said, you don't want to be in the streets of this city, in the city of Sodom. So he brings in Lot. And what happens in Sodom at night is that all the men of the city come to Lot and say, bring forth the men that came into thee this night so that we may know them. And it, it, he's not saying we want to ask him what his favorite color is. You know, when they says they want to know him, it means they want to rape these men. Men working that which is unseemly with other men. That's what a sodomite is, a homosexual. Okay? That's the Bible word for it, sodomite. And he says here, uh, uh, do, he, so he says that, you know, first of all, verse 17, there shall be no whore, right, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Now, verse 18, he uses the same term for whore, right? Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, and then he goes on, or the price of a dog, okay? So he's not talking about two different things here. He's not talking about a sodomite and a dog being two different things. He's saying that sodomites, that homosexuals, are dogs. That's how God looks at them. You say, I don't believe you. That's the Bible, friend. I'm, re I'm reading the scripture to you tonight. That's what the Bible says. 
And if you got a problem with what I'm saying, you have a problem with the Bible. Okay? And he's saying here that, it, that they are a dog. He says sodomite, and then he says dog. Dog is a reference that God used to refer to a sodomite. And, he, you know, and, the, and the new versions of the Bible, I went ahead and looked this up, and sure enough, they all want to tone this down. And society wants to tone this down. Well, you're not going to tone me down. Okay? When you have these perverts and, they're, and working all their filth and corrupting our youth and flaunting their, their sin and marching up and down in our cities half naked, uh, you know, uh, doing all the filthy things that they do in their parade and forcing all this crap down our throats and telling us that we're intolerant. You bet I'm intolerant. I'm not going to tolerate it for a second because it's filth. And God calls them dogs. And here's the thing. Uh, you know, uh, he calls them dogs and it's fitting term to give them. It's a fitting term. Because these, and, and what was I saying? The new versions, right? They tone it down. And you're not going to tone me down. I already said that. <laughs> right? I made that point. But these new versions, like society, they want to tone this down. Oh, dog, that's kind of harsh. Sodomite. We don't want to use that. We're going to use the term male prostitutes. You know, that's still not anything good. We still know what that is, and we're like, ugh. And any, any normal person is repulsed by that. You know, it's just some, a lot of people don't have the guts to say it. To say, you know, uh, you know homosexuals are disgusting. What they do in secret... Because here's the thing, you know, you just watch them on TV and you just have your friend or your relative and they seem normal. That's, you're only seeing a fraction of their life. You have no idea what they do behind closed doors. You know, and there's statistics. You want to go study the, the, the lifestyle that they live on cdc.org? They are, they are disease-ridden people. And they, they live, you know, I wish they'd teach that, you know, in their LGBTQ history month at these public schools. That if you're a sodomite, you know, you're likely not to reach 60. Well, tell them, well, don't smoke, kids. So you'd shorten your lifespan by a few years. Well, if you're a sodomite, you might not even make it to 60. They won't tell them that because Satan's got his agenda. I got I to gotta stay focused here. I'm going <laughs> to... Right? But dog is a fitting term. Okay? Dog is a fitting term for a sodomite. You say, why would God call a homosexual a dog? Because it's a fitting term. Because sodomites behave like dogs. You know, I wish I'd made, brought a few more uh, facts with me tonight to read for you. But you know, you know how many part they have multitudes of partners. Like a dog. A dog goes after anything that moves. I remember when we were, uh, me and my little sister, we were staying at my dad's. And his, one of his roommates got this dog, right? And this dog, you know, was just becoming a full-grown dog. And he had, you know... <laughs> And we're, we're playing hide and seek at night, right, and from this dog. And next thing we know, this dog's like trying to just get on everything and do what dogs do, right, to make other dogs. You ever seen a dog do that to a chair, <laughs> to a blanket, to a pillow, to a, a stuffed animal, to your leg? Anything it can get, wrap its legs around and, 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 and show who's boss in that way, that's what a dog does. You know why God calls sodomites dogs? Because they're the same way. They'll go after anything. Remember Judges 19, they came to rape that other man, the men of that city in, in, in Benjamin, they came to rape that man, these sodomites, the homosexuals. And by the way, every time you read about sodomites in the, home, in the, in the Bible, <coughs> they're nothing but just rapists. But what did they end up doing? They ended up raping the woman. Sodomites go both ways. They say, oh, they're bisexual, he's homosexual. No, they, none of them are. They're all bisexual. They'll go after anything. You know, you go, go, lead, go read Leviticus 19, you know, and, and, and it, it, it talks about, you know, them being, uh, it goes right down the list from, you know, men with men to bestiality. And that's what's coming next. <coughs> so dog is a fitting term because a dog doesn't have any inhibition in this area. It'll, do, it'll go after anything that moves. And a lot of things that don't, <laughs> right? And they behave like beasts. That's what a that's what the the, the, the biblical term for a, for an animal in the Bible is beast, okay? And that's what the that's why it's describing him thus as a dog because a dog is an animal. And what does it say in Second Peter about reprobates? People have been rejected. They are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. You speak evil of things that they understand not. Jude chapter one. 
These speak evil those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. So the Bible calls them dogs. It calls them animals. And you say, well, why is that? And if you would, turn over to Jeremiah chapter 6. And hopefully you've got your Bible in your lap. So it's not just, you think it's just me making this up. You're actually seeing it with your own two eyes in the Word of God tonight. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 30. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 30. Why does God say they're animals? Why does God say that they're beasts? Why does God say that they're dogs? Why does God call them these things? These things? Because they, they're called, they're reprobates. They've been given over to do those things which are not convenient. It says in verse 30, Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. What is the biblical definition of a reprobate? Being rejected by God. It couldn't be any plainer than it is right there. I mean, how many different ways does God have to say this to, for people to get it? Reprobate silver shall men call them. Why are they going to call them reprobate? Because God's rejected them. Okay? Not because God's, you know, just holding them at arm's length. Not that God's just, you know, patiently waiting. No, God has rejected them. You know what it means to reject something? No good. Can't use it. Done. Don't want it. Throw it away. It's disposable. That's what it is it reject something. <laughs> and you go over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Say, well, that's a lot of Old Testament tonight. Well, let's go to Romans 1. It's pretty New Testament for me. First chapter, you know, the first epistle in the New Testament. <clears throat> for, this God, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Listen to me. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. Yes, the Bible addresses this. Watching that which is unseemly and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. So what does it mean when it says that women did natural to change a natural use to that which is into that which is against nature? You know, these are, you know, your your lesbians, right? The Bible just classifies them all as sodomites. Okay? Homosexual women, women that are leaving the natural use of the woman, okay? Uh, they turned that, excuse me, that's the men. They did change the natural use into that which is against nature. The Bible is saying that homosexuals are against nature. It's not natural for a man to desire another man. Newsflash, it's not natural for a woman to desire another woman. It doesn't come naturally. And it's not because they're taught that, you know, there is no gay gene. They weren't born that way. You know, it, it, it's saying here that they leave that. That they become this. This is something that happens to them. They leave the natural use of the woman. They change the natural use into that which is against nature. They burn in their lust one to another, toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. In verse 28, And as even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a what? A reprobate mind. And what is the meaning of reprobate? Rejected by God. The reason why they burn in their lust one toward another, men with men and women with women, is because God has rejected them. God has given them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Convenient meaning things that are not at hand. Things that do not come naturally to a human being. You know, the best illustration I've ever heard is this, to try to get this across to you. I, I challenge anyone to get up here, or after service, don't do it now, because you know, we'll all laugh if you pull it off, but I don't think you will. And try, to, and try to just fall on your face. Just put your hands behind your back and try to just fall on your face. You can't do it. There is something in your body that will just naturally get you to stop yourself. You just have this God-given, inborn reaction to keep you from busting your face and knocking out your teeth on the floor here and having all of us go, you idiot. <laughs> right? There's, that's just part of your, your human response. It's there. It's a natural response. You know, it's not natural. The Bible says it's, it's against nature. It's, against, it's, 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 it's not convenient. It's not at hand. It's not a natural thing for men to burn in their lust towards men and women to burn in their lust towards women. We have, normal people have an innate, rep they're repulsed by that. 
They, 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 they're, no, no one in here that's saved, you know, hopefully nobody in here, period, is struggling with this. Right. Is saying, boy, I'm just having these weird thoughts about, you know, the same gender. That's not natural. It's, it's not. And the Bible's showing us that the reason why people get to that place is because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They reject God. They reject God. They reject the Bible. They say, oh, that preacher, he's just full of it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, my, you know they said at my school, my friend said this, my dad said that, my mom said this. The Bible's not true, blah, blah, blah. And they reject God. You know, the God gives them time and time again a chance to receive the gospel. They reject it, reject it. And finally, God gets to the place where he says, I'm done with you. I reject you. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate mind. People need to recognize that. These people think that they have their whole life to get right with God or get saved or accept Christ as their Savior. You don't. Now, I don't know where that line is for everybody, but the Bible's clear that there is a line that people cross where God says, I'm done. You say, I thought God loves everyone. Bible says, God so loved the world. Past tense. Yes, God loved everyone at one time. But he also says elsewhere that he will love them no more. That he hated them. Right? So people can get to a place where they reject God long enough. And God says, okay, I'm done with you. And they turns them over to reprobate mind. And God removes that natural inhibition to be repulsed by those things that an animal would do. I mean, dogs will go after the same gender. Oh, homosexual is perfectly natural. Even the animals do it. Have you ever heard that argument? That's biblical. Thank you for making my case. Dogs also eat their own vomit. And, and do all kinds of disgusting things. Do you want to start teaching that in our schools? We'll do everything a dog does, kids. It's against nature. And the reason why people get involved in it is because they reject God long enough and finally, God rejects them and turns them over to a reprobate mind, removes that inhibition. So now, spiritually speaking, they can fall flat on their face and mess up, you know, and damage and hurt themselves with that lifestyle. <coughs> so he says they're going to be reprobate silver. He says that they have a reprobate mind. And the point that it's making in Deuteronomy is that they are not to be in the congregation of the children of Israel. In fact, God says there shall not be any. Because the, the, the death penalty was what God prescribed. That if they were found out, you know, it wasn't just keep them in the closet. It was drag them out of the closet and deal with them. <coughs> and you say, well, why, why doesn't God want it in the congregation? Well, they won't be in heaven. They won't be in heaven. The Bible's clear about that. There won't be any dogs, which is another word for sodomite, in heaven. I'll read to you from Revelation. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. He's saying, look, you're blessed if, you're in, if you enter through the gates because outside are dogs. You know, no dogs allowed in heaven. No sodomites. Why? Because they've been rejected by God. That's why they are the way they are. That's how they got to that place to begin with. They rejected God, rejected God. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. He says, fine, I'm done with you. And men shall call them reprobate silver. And that's what we need some men to do today. We need preaching like this. People to get up and say they're reprobate silver. They're rejected by God. Amen. And stop, you know, it's one thing to have, it's one thing to have the sodomites rage at this. Of course they're going to. That's a perfectly natural reaction. Do you think I am surprised when some sodomite gets upset at a sermon like this and goes online and has to comment or call the church and leave a nasty, you know, call us all kind of vulgar names. I, should, I, you know, I, I wish sometimes I could play some of these voicemails for people who think that these sodomites are just loving, kind people. You should, you should hear some of these people, things they say. You know, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. They've wished some of the worst punishments and, and death and misfortune on godly men that I, I mean, can't even repeat it. But word to God that we had some more men that would say, say, hey, they're reprobate, they're rejected. We need more preaching like that. Because of the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to stem a, a flood here. You know, I mean, it's so much, anyone who's been alive for any length of time has seen the change in this culture when it comes to this issue. I remember when they pulled the plug on Ellen, Ellen Degenerate. I, I'm Degenerous. 
when she had her little sitcom that I watched as like a nine-year-old, and I thought it was funny, I'd watch her stand up, and I was an Ellen Degenerate fan, and then it, she came out of the closet as a, as a sodomite, and I think it was NBC pulled the plug on that show. What's she doing today? She's got one of the biggest shows in the, in the, in the world. Thank you, brother. She's very popular today, isn't she? They're promoting her. Oh, everyone loves Ellen. Big change from a network pulling her plug to now promoting her. You know what I often think about? Who remembers the SNL, the Saturday Night Live skit? It's Pat. Who remembers that one? Eee, right? The whole gag was trying to figure out if Pat was a man or a woman. Do you think they'd ever run that skit today? They'd get run out of town on a rail. <coughs> so things have changed. And that's why we need people to stand up and quit pandering these people. It's perfectly natural to hear it from them, to hear the sodomite <coughs> sodomites rage and say, how dare you call for the death penalty of homosexuals? Well, yeah, of course you're going to be mad about that because I'm saying you should be put to death according to the Bible. I'm saying you're a dog. The Bible's saying you're a dog. Of course, it's perfectly natural you're going to get mad. You know what I can't stand is when Christians stand with them against the man of God and against the Bible. And say, well, I'm a Christian and I believe that. I, and, and then you see these, these so-called Christians going out and apologizing to the LGBTQ community. We're sorry. God loves you. Have you read the Bible, friend? Have you even read it once, cover to cover, in your entire life? Because it's, it's, it's there. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Re, you know, reprobate silver shall men call them, for he has rejected them. Romans 1 couldn't be clear. Jude, 2 Peter, read these books. <coughs> You know, and we need this preaching to warn people, right? And Paul warns us in Philippians 3, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. And to, uh, to, you me, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but to you it is safe. Beware of dogs. He says it right in there. And you thought beware of dogs was just a sign that people put on their fence. That's a biblical concept. That's a biblical, you know, that's scripture. Beware of dogs, you know. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Maybe we should start writing that on all those soul when we got soul just bring a marker. Beware of dogs. Philippians 3, verse 2. And then people go read this, like, whoa. What does dog mean in the Bible? Whoa! What is he saying be, why, when he says beware of dogs? Beware of the sodomite. Beware of the reprobate. Because they're evil. Because there's no good that's going to come from them. That's why God says they shall not be among the children of Israel. Get rid of them. That's the only thing God says to do with them. <clears throat> Verse 19, he says, let's move on here. It's getting late. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that's lent upon usury. Now, usury is lending with interest. That's what usury is. I'm going to lend you money, but you're going to pay me interest. You're going to pay me back the principal plus what I lent you. Or what I lent you plus extra. Right? We all understand that. Uh, unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to, do, uh, hand to in the land where thou goest to possess it. So he's saying, look, don't, don't lend upon usury against your brother. Why is it? Because anybody who has a credit card knows that usury is a form of control. And that's biblical too. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, the rich, ruler, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Okay, anyone who's been in credit card debt knows that the borrower is servant to the lender. And you want to talk about lending on usury with 24.999999% you know, on your one tank of gas, you know, that $35 item turns into a lot over time, right? And people borrow a little bit on these cards. They spend a thousand here, a thousand there, and next thing you know, they're paying it off over years. And you know, <laughs> It's depressing when you look at the bill and they, you don't even want to look at it. Like, how much, how much of this monthly payment is actually going towards the principal? It's a fraction. And they're just like, ah, interest, interest, you know? So he's saying, look, you, you know, don't do that to one another. Why? Because doing that is a form of, of control. It's a, it's a way to oppress people financially. And uh, he says in Exodus 22, If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him in, as an usurer. So, you know, the theme, well, I'll just say that for the end. Neither shalt thou lay upon him uh, usury. If thou take it all, at all take thy brother's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver to him by the sun that, that the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin. Wherewith in, wherein shall he sleep? 
And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. So God's saying, don't lend upon usury. Why? Because he's gracious. You know, and we are to emulate our heavenly father. You know, we are to, we are to uh, you know, let our light wor works uh, so shine before men that they may, we are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our father which is in heaven. And if we're just going around lending on user, everybody, that's not a good look. No, you know, I'm not writing thank you letters to, you know, to Amazon for the, for the, you know, the interest they're charging me. It's so nice of you, Amazon. Thank you, Visa. Oh, man, I just love those people over at MasterCard, you know, making me pay three times what I initially spent through the use of usury. That's not a gracious thing to be a usurer. And God is gracious. And he's saying, look, I, I am gracious. Therefore, don't lend with, you know, unto people expecting to gain from them. Jesus said in Luke 6, love your enemies and do good on, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. That's the commandment, is to lend, not even expecting anything in return. So that's the, the principle there. Now, of course, you know, this, 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 uh, this commandment to not lend upon usury ties right in with the theme of this chapters and others that we've looked at these last few weeks that are dealing with uh, hard things, you know, things that might strike close to home with us, but things that God addresses head on and doesn't, you know, doesn't pull any punches because God understands that all these things, you know, the, the fatherlessness in our homes, uh, you know, the whoredoms that, that take place, <coughs> prostitution, the sodomy, the usury, that these things, you know, are detrimental to society, you know, and, 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 and we have to learn to spare our feelings or not to not spare our feelings, you know, not, you know, don't, don't sacrifice, you know, good teaching on the altar of your feelings and say, oh, well, you know, I just, I feel differently. But is it biblical? At the end of the day, that's what we all have to ask ourselves. Is the preacher, is that preacher crazy? <laughs> is, or, or is what I'm saying true? You know, it, it, is what I'm saying the Bible? And if it is, then you have to step back and ask yourself, who do I really have a problem with? Is it the guy up here? Or is it the guy up there, the Lord? And I don't mean to call him the guy in a, in a you know, in a, in a uh, uh, disrespectful way. I mean that to make that illustration. You know, the <coughs> are we upset with this man or are you extended with the, our Father in heaven? So again, all these things are here for our own good. And, and we would be better off as a society and as a people if this was the law of the land. And we might not be able to see that, but that's what the Bible says. And at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, who do we believe, the world or the Bible? Let's go ahead and pray.